Hey guys, this is Ken McRoy and you are listening to the Mailbox Money Show with Bronson Hill. All right. So if you're a limited partner, you want to be invested in deals. Uh, asking the right questions is the most important thing. It's been said that the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your questions. And I think that's very true when it comes to be a passive investor. What questions you're asking, how you're vetting your deals, really, really, really important. This is probably the biggest part of a financial education for an investor that I can see. And so my guest today, Goodell and Schultz, he, he basically has has a lot of information on things that he does, how to vet a sponsor, looking through situations, questions you should ask, some great stories. I think you're really gonna enjoy it. Let's jump in, let's go for it. All right, Dallin, welcome to the show. So excited to have you at the Mailbox Money Show today, man. Yeah, Bronson, thanks so much for this invite. Glad we were able to connect. What was that? A couple, probably a couple months ago. Yeah, we were at a live event in Pasadena, which was great. You flew in for that and spoke at that. And I was drawn to your bald head, similar to mine, as well as your amazing mustache. Like you have like the closest to Raleigh Fingers mustache that I think I've seen in a long time. So it's well, awesome. You know, it's great to, uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Great to be able to connect. Um, so tell us, give us a little bit of a background on you. Um, I think you have a very interesting story, uh, very compelling. And I uh, just, I, I love your approach to a lot of things. And you're a very intelligent person when it comes to how you approach investing and just some of the different things you've gotten involved with. But, but give give folks a little bit of background into who you are and how you got started here. Sure. And and uh, real quick, you mentioned intelligent. I wouldn't so much say intelligent, but maybe intentional. Maybe Intentional. That's yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to say I'm the most intelligent person, but I do uh, incorporate some strategic thinking into into our moves along with, at the end of the day, you just got to take action. But yeah. anyway, man, again, really appreciate you having me on and, and loved our short conversation we had in Pasadena and looking forward to connect further. So a little bit about me. Um, I, I, I run a private equity fund now. We focus on multifamily acquisitions do have some experience in self-storage ground up development. I wouldn't say by any means I'm an expert in that because we did one deal and that was it. But sure. um, it's been a lot of fun, a lot of uh, learning experience. We actually just got our certificate of occupancy for that last week. So that was a huge turning point and uh, yeah. exciting. But uh, I didn't I didn't start here in the real estate space. Um, ironically, if, if it's all right, I'll, I'll take it back to to my childhood. Yeah. Sure. Um, my it all began with a young boy in a dream, right? That's a young, right. A young boy in a dream without a mustache and plenty of hair. <laughs> um, so my grandfather actually owned at his busiest time about 300 units of multifamily. Huh. And my father was the landlord. He managed all of it. So I grew up around this my entire life. And uh, my my understanding, my uh, mindset on, on real estate was that of a landlord. Cause that my dad, that's what my dad did. And mm -hmm. I worked with him during the summers and I would do all that dirty grunt work. Right. Yeah. And it was great as a teenage kid. I always had summer work. I got paid good. I learned a lot of useful skills, but that was my, uh, mindset and, and understanding yeah. of what real estate ownership was. It didn't even occur to me to ask my grandfather how he even got into buying these. Cause sure. here's the thing, like, you don't know what you don't know. And as a kid out of my grandparents, that grandpa was probably the most frugal he gave. And this like this is going to sound really low, so don't judge me. People will. <laughs> he gave the least amount on birthdays, least amount at Christmas. And mm -hmm. so as a kid, you associate money with wealth. And so as a kid, I'm like, oh, maybe that's why I didn't have any interest in asking him because I thought he was the poor grandfather. Mm -hmm. Look, I know he was building up this multi-million dollar empire behind the scenes and I had no freaking idea mm. what he was doing. So anyways, that was my understanding of, of real estate and, I, and it sucked. This was in upstate New York. You know, I was up at three or four o'clock in the morning before school, shoveling sidewalks, throwing salt on the sidewalks to de-ice them so tenants wouldn't slip and hurt themselves. I was up on roofs in the middle of the humid summers in New York, shingling and doing all that stuff, changing out nasty toilets, changing out gross sink drains that were clogged with hair. All the fun stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> right. All the fun stuff. So I was like, yeah, great skills. Not for me. And I actually went into the medical field because mm. I had a desire to make an impact to serve people. I had air conditioning in the summer. I had heat in the winter. It was great. <laughs> But uh, a few months into that career, I actually broke my leg playing mm. soccer. Oh, no. And one of the big reasons I got into the medical field was for the 
safety and the stability, the security, right? I knew people were always going to get sick and hurt. Right. So I knew I'd always have a job and I was going to specialize, make a few hundred thousand dollars a year. And then I always wanted to get into real estate. I just thought it would be years down the road. Yeah. So uh, that incident though, it, uh, it was literally <laughs> my breaking point because at that time I got four kids. Now I had two kids at the time and they were the first thing that came to mind. How could mm. I actually provide for my family if I can't work? Yeah. And at the time I was working in an emergency room. And so if you can imagine you're running codes and there's traumas and you're on your feet for 13 hours, it was long days and wow. do that with a broken leg. So that was my, that was my, oh crap moment. Like, yeah. And, and I was probably, let's see here. I was probably around 25, 26 at the mm -hmm. time. And I realized something had a change and uh it was because of that incident as hard as it was that really jump-started my education down the real estate space and our first purchase was a fourplex without any of our own money and then i started learning about syndications i started learning about funds and fast forward a few years now we're managing a multi-million dollar fund and helping mm -hmm. other people get involved in apartment yeah. ownership so amazing it's been a uh, quite the journey to say the least yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that's what I found it's, it's a lot of this starts with something small, right? And it's something from, uh, it's kind of cool with your background that you had some of that in your blood or some of that in your background that your family members had done. And I have a couple um, relatives. I had my, my grandfather, my mom's dad was a vice president of Ford in the sixties. And then he retired early and did a bunch of other investing things and stuff and lived in Hawaii and then Costa Rica and did all, he did some really innovative stuff and then ended up kind of, it all kind of got lost after he died, which is unfortunate. And then, um, and then my, I've just, I've had some pretty, you know, it's, it's, I've had actually, that's an interesting thought too. My, my dad's talked about this where sometimes you'll have success in your family and sometimes it can skip a generation. Uh, don't tell your parents, but sometimes it can skip a generation, right? <laughs> that um, it can cause uh, just a lot of uh, ability to be successful through just kind of having that background and knowing it's there. It's almost like too, if someone's parent, if, if their parents or their family has alcoholics in their background, you're more likely, you know, five times more likely to be an alcoholic or something. There's also positives too. There's all the positive things that you're able to get. And I know um, you, I have to get one of your social media posts. It looks like you, you injured yourself in soccer and you had, you also had like a bike accident too, didn't you? Where you like had elbow, like dueling elbow surgeries or something, or was that at the dueling, same time? Just tell us that story real quick. <laughs> dueling elbow surgery. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I'm very accident prone. I don't have weak bones. I just, I do stupid shit and I just, I, I <laughs> injured myself doing it. So here's, here's a really cool thing. And I'm glad you brought this up, Bronson. So my, I, I broke my leg. I shared that story and that triggered the desire to get into real estate. And we bought our first fourplex with, within a few months of that incident. Like it was pretty quick, like something in my brain just shifted and I made it happen. Um, and that's a whole nother story for another time. But fast forward a couple years, this was March 2020. Okay, we all know what happened in 2020 with COVID and stuff. I was renting a mountain bike that I was going to purchase that weekend just because I wanted to get more involved in mountain biking exercise. I, I just love it. I found it's the one, one of the few activities I could do where my mind and my body are in the same place at the same time. Yeah. It helps me be present. So anyways, I rented this mountain bike and I, I came off a jump, hit my front brake too hard. And I, I just flung over the handlebars. Like, yeah. Not just like man, like, like catapulted, right? Like, wow. Yeah, like yeah. straight into the ground. And I came down on, on both elbows, oh. it shattered both of them. And it was a $35,000 surgery. Oh my gosh. Under anesthesia for about eight hours. Oh my goodness. Um, and you, so, so you had them both at the same time. time. I couldn't just do one. Like that so, was, most people would just do one. I did both of them. Well, and, and then you can't take care of yourself. It was very difficult. Uh, unfortunately, I have a very, very supportive and loving wife. That oh, helped. okay. <laughs> and uh, I remember, but I'm, I'm super stubborn too and prideful. So it was right. hard for her to help me with things. So I remember yeah. <laughs> pouring, like one of my hands, I had some rotational movement in it. Yeah. So we're pouring my pills 
on the counter and like slurping it up off the counter because I didn't want her giving me my medication. Yeah. So, but and that was the reality of it. And, uh, and we, we laughed about it and it was fun, but um, here's the cool thing. Literally three weeks before that incident, that very first fourplex I bought because of my broken leg. And I told myself, I said, if something was like this, was to happen again, how would I provide for my family? That was yeah. a burning question that really drove the purchase of that first fourplex. Just a few weeks before I broke both elbows, it was a couple of years later, we sold that first property. So now I'm sitting on over six digits wow. in my bank account, and then I break both elbows. Yeah. Talk about a night and day experience. That that first incident. Yeah, you didn't have wondering anything. how I was going to financially provide. Yeah, and then the second incident just solidified even more that I was on the right path. I mean, had I not made that choice, that decision yeah. two years earlier, I would have found myself in the same freaking spot that I was in two years ago. You know, it's it's really a great point, Dallin. I think it's huge for anybody listening. It's just. Um, you know, something will happen and we'll get to a, a, a circumstance and it's like, oh, like there's kind of this, oh crap moment of like, how am I going to, how am I going to work? How, how's this going to work out? Or the job isn't, I don't like this as much as I thought, or maybe what happens if I have an injury? What happens if I get disabled? What happens if something happens to me? How's my family going to be taken care of? And that's where the part of developing the mailbox money, being able to fire yourself that you're not tied to. Uh, something. And like you said, the second example you gave, you had a hundred K in the bank, you had multiple, you, you, you had a lot of cushion there that you didn't have before. And yeah. I think that's where, um, for a lot of people, when they start to have that revelation, Oh, I can actually create this on my own. And this is the problem I find with a lot of wall street stuff is that having been a, you know, I call myself, I was a RAA, which is a registered investment advisor. I'm still an RAA, but it's, it's a recovering investment advisor. And so I'm, you know, I've just realized, you know, I realized over the years and in my book, there's a chapter on this about watch out for wall street. There's so much misalignment of interest between investors. And, um, you know, it's, it says over 50% of people managing, uh, large investment funds have $0 invested in with their investors. And so it's kind of crazy. Like it's kind of this, the misalignment there, but I think for people, um, you know, risk is a big deal. Making sure what you have, you can keep and what you can keep, you can grow. And so that's kind of really what I wanted to get in with you today about is, uh, protecting your investment, really vetting deals. You had some unique things you were sharing a little earlier about, uh, you know, how LPs can vet deals. Cause again, a lot of times we just think, Oh, you know, when you're first starting out, every deal looks great. Oh, I'm going to triple my money in five years or double my money in five years. That's great. But you know, a lot of things can go wrong between here and there. And so what are some, some things that you've learned that you wanted to share to individuals about, um, especially about vetting deals and vetting operators and that process? hundred percent. And there, there's actually three things I'd like, I'd like to touch on. So I'm going to say them now, Bronson. So when I forget five minutes from now, what <laughs> they were, you can prompt me. Okay. Right. Sure. If my mind goes a hundred miles an hour. Um, the first one that I, that I'll share briefly is what I would consider the number one mistake that passive investors make when vetting an opportunity. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about that. The second one especially right now is understanding the the financing terms in the deals that people are getting involved in today given the the market and the economy we're in and number three is um capital calls that's what it was okay capital calls got it so number one the number one mistake that i see most passive investors making is that they spend all this time betting the deal itself Betting the deal itself, meaning somebody sends you a 150 unit apartment building in Dallas, Texas. Here's all the rent growth. Here's all the information on the property. And people are just digging in and underwriting that deal. I say that's a number one mistake because that's a lot of the information that's being given to you as a passive investor. And let me ask you this. When was the last time you received an investment opportunity that didn't look good on paper? They always look good. They always look, great. always look good. Yeah, for sure. Right. So people get hung up underwriting this deal and they decide to invest. And then that deal goes south and they wonder why. Come to find out it was the operations team. This was the first mm. deal we ever did together. 
they joined some mentorship group six months ago and they like bootstrapped this thing together and and they decided to to go for it. So our recommendation with anyone looking to get involved in any investment opportunity, not just real estate, is spend 80% of your time vetting the operator. Yeah. If if I present you a deal, if Bronson presents you a deal, spend 80% of your time getting to know us and our team. How do we operate? How do we think? When did things go wrong? What did we do to address it? That should be 80% of your time. Ask the tough questions. The other 10%, you should be vetting the market. Where is the deal located? Is it in Dallas, which is, or Houston, or, or Phoenix, where you have a lot of job growth, population growth? Mm. Or is it in a small Ponunk town in a tertiary market? Not saying that those deals are bad, but at Rev, we really try to stack the deck, if you will. And we do that by choosing the right operator and choosing the right market. And then the remaining 10% should be spent vetting the deal itself. Sure. So yeah, it's that the operator, then the market, then look at the deal. Because if you have a good operations team, they're going to be able to manage that deal effectively. Yeah. Let, let's make a comment about that too. I think that's, that's really true. A lot of people look at the deal and they don't really think about the team. And really, if a deal does not work, usually it is the team. And that's where, um, you know, and even how you do that a lot of times is, you know, looking at their website, their values, having a conversation with them, talking to previous investors, all that stuff. Um, and it, what are some other ways you think people can vet a, a group that they would work with or if you're going to spend the majority of time there? So I, this is kind of cliche and, and uh, people might think it's kind of cheesy, if you will. But some of the operators we've partnered with, I've been watching them for a couple of years on social media. I've been I've been watching them, seeing their deals, seeing what they're doing, see how they they're interacting with people. I connect with people that have previously invested with them as an LP and say, hey, what has been your experience? What are some things that you like or some things you didn't like? So we do that due diligence that you can do that in the background. I mean, a lot of these people are all over social media. Um, go out, visit them, shake their hand, take time to to really get to know them. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's your capital, it's your investment. Some investors are putting up a few hundred thousand dollars and they've never even met the person they're investing with. Right. Yeah, so, totally. That's it. Um, no, it's, it so, is amazing. Yeah, I some mean, nice people. That's one simple thing you can do. Yeah, no, that's, that's really true. I think that a lot of people are, um, they just, they don't really get to know folks. I, I thought it was kind of crazy when I first started hearing about this, this world that people, will invest with people they've never met or they don't know, or they don't, they've never like, how do you know this person's real? And there's ways you can figure it out. Obviously, you know, the more connections someone has, the more you see them at events, the more you're, um, you know, kind of listening to what they're saying and you're kind of like, okay, this person is actually, seems like they're really just trying to add value. And that's how we've yeah. found a lot of investors is just, we're trying to answer questions. A lot of people are asking, which I know you are as well with your podcast and show that you're doing. Um, okay, so you want to talk about that, and then there was capital calls, and there was something else, I think, right yeah, in there. The right? Financing, and I'll touch okay. on this real sure. quick. So, especially financing right now, there's there's a lot of distressed deals coming to market. You and I are aware of this. A lot of people in the space are, and it's because people got into these short term loans two or three years ago that are coming due, but now we're not in a favorable refinancing market. So, if you are getting involved in deals today or this year, make sure they're set up to weather whatever's going to happen these next two to three years. So for example, the, one of the most recent deals our team got involved in, it's a seven-year fixed loan with seven years of interest only at at 4.85%. So incredible financing terms. And so the terms don't necessarily need to look like that, but just whatever deal you're getting involved in, make sure you ask the operators and you understand what type of loan are they putting into place. So that's huge. And, and the third thing I wanted to touch on was capital calls. Because of these deals that people got into uh, maybe more aggressively than they should have a few years ago, there's a lot of operators doing capital calls. And I'm not saying that a capital call is is bad. It's, it's Sometimes it happens. And nobody expected to have what happened with interest rates. Nobody planned for that. Nobody expected it, right? But there's still some operators out there that even with these changes have not performed any capital calls and there's some that have. And so as you're looking to invest with somebody, I always encourage investors to ask, 
the operator, have you ever performed a capital call? And if they said no, that lets you know that, hey, even two or three years ago, they were probably pretty conservative with their projections, or they had a lot of reserves on hand for the unknown. If they did perform a capital call, it's not a deal breaker. So don't, don't misinterpret this. It's not a deal breaker, but just requires further questions. Ask them, say, okay, I understand that what happens last year was unprecedented. What did you learn from it? And how are you and your team preventing it from happening in the future? And just mm -hmm. see what they say. See yeah. what they say. If they if they've really implemented a plan to prevent a capital call from happening in the future, they should be able to spit it out like that. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's really a great point. And we've we've had a couple of deals that have had capital calls, and and uh, they've all come from bridge debt. I think in the middle too, having value add stuff the last few years, there's been a lot of unforeseen things, and some things you can say, you know, this these things could have been managed better. And that's one of the reasons we've shifted both to other types of assets, ATMs, car washes, and oil and gas and other things, as well as we're doing multifamily deals. We want to make sure we have fixed debt. And it's it's just a great, um, you know, sometimes it's it's better to say the best deal sometimes is the deal you didn't do. And it's yeah. hard, to be honest, it's hard as an operator to say no when you can raise millions of dollars like over a deal. It's hard to like be like, oh, I'm not going to take this money and invest uh, because you're excited about the deal, you're excited about raising the money, you're excited, and, and there's kind of a like as an operator, you know, you can kind of feel a little bit like, well, uh, we've got to keep doing deals in order to just keep the lights on and to pay employees and pay myself. Like you got, like it's a business as well. And so um, I think as I've, you know, hopefully become older and wiser, I can't say I have less hair. Um, or maybe I'll have more hair and have a mustache like yours. But um, there's lessons that come, and it's like you know, okay, well, it's better to do things that are. Um, you know, you really are understanding. And I always ask too, what's the one or two primary risks that I see about this deal? And then asking the operator, what do you see other risks there too? Those are also always good questions to ask as well. Um, investors, on no. that note too, Browns, investors are yeah. understanding. Like as long as you're communicating with them, investors are understanding. So sure. if you do have to perform a capital call, like as unfortunate as it is, don't hide it. Like be upfront, be honest. Like let your investors know, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we learned from it. This is how we're preventing it from happening in the future. But with that being said, this is still the position that we're we're in. And that's, listen, that's part of the risk coming on as, an, as a passive investor. And as an equity owner, you are an equity partner in that deal. So yeah. some of that risk, but you're also entitled to a, a portion of the upside. That's one of the benefits. And that's one of the give and takes. If you want something slow, steady, boring, guaranteed, go get into your 5% CD at your local bank or something, right? But like no. most people that are getting involved in these types of deals, they trust the operator and they want a piece of the upside. And so they're willing to take on some of that risk. But yeah. just open, communicate with your investors. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's that's a great word. And I think uh, it's communication is so important. And that's why, that's why I like to talk about it too. A lot of people don't talk about capital call don't talk about especially if they're they've had some i think it's important to talk about it because um you know when it happens it's important to i know one guy i talked to he's like oh, i'm in five capital calls right now and oh my gosh you know and how to how to work through that and what do you do and what do you learn from that you know what are there's some learnings that happen there and it's easy to in general in life it's easy to blame but it's the the thing or the lessons that we gather from it is really important um we i wanted to talk about one more thing with you here yeah. um we're we're doing a couple of development stuff it's a development projects you have done development in the past um you we were talking we we're going to call this the title of this podcast is going to be like why it's a good time for development you're like i don't i don't think this is a good time for development i was like oh let's talk about that that's great so um tell me what, what do you, i mean obviously interest rates are higher so costs are higher um you know are you seeing just across the board that development really doesn't make sense right now or would you say there are certain areas you're saying oh maybe a development of this type of asset or is it just kind of across the board from what you're seeing you just don't feel it's a good time so this this is my major disclaimer for this okay and and I, i've done two development deals one we entitled the land and sold it and right. then the other one we just finished was which was the self-storage so you talked my my take on this is going to be different than someone that's been in development for 30 years because they're going to have their systems, teams, processes, preferred. They're going to have all that stuff in place. They're going to have it way more dialed in. So these comments I'm going to share are geared more towards those people that have been considering development that have never done it yet. I'll just say like newbies, newbies in development space. Okay. I'll just, I'll direct it towards them. 
three years ago when we started that development project, I'd say it was a great time. Good interest rates, prices were down on products, right? Just over these last three years as of, as with us finishing this project, interest rates went up, inflation went through the freaking roof. Our projected budget for this project increased quite a bit just over the, the span of that time. So if I was to look at the same project in that same area in today's market, I'm telling you right now, I would not do it because financially it wouldn't make sense. Now that was a self-storage development in a tertiary market. This isn't a class A mixed use development in Phoenix or Houston or Dallas or some major MSA. So that's why I, I'm speaking from my experience, but take from it what you will. Um, interest rates too. And just trying to get loans on development right now is pretty tough. Now we were fortunate when we got into this project a few years ago that we got a good interest rate on our construction loan for 18 months interest only, and it just converted over to fixed financing. We didn't have to worry about a refinance or anything. Had we had to refinance in the last few months since we finished this, we probably would have had to do a massive capital call to, to, to make it work. We would have had to infuse more capital into that deal to get that equity up for it to make sense for the lender. So that's why I just think now is, I'm not saying it's a horrible time. If you do want to get into development, make sure you're partnering with someone that has a significant amount of experience and that has been through development back in 2008, 2009. Because from what I'm hearing, I wasn't involved in real estate back then. What I'm hearing is what we're going through now seems eerily similar to what we did back then, just with the economy and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a consideration if things pull back. What's that look like? What does debt look like? Um, and I think, and some construction debt, you know, there there is for development. Some is fixed, some is not, and some is, uh, and th there's I guess there's different ways to look at it. I look at you know at some points if, if rates do drop a little bit, or if the economy, you know, it's just it's hard to say. Are we you know we actually technically we were in a recession in 2022 Q1 and Q2 but they said oh we're not actually in a recession and they were <laughs> they said oh it's it's the labor market looks good so we're not in recession so they keep, kind of keep the government will redefine what they feel recession is but um i think that for 2024 we're going to see some of these lingering things and um and it probably too depends what uh what you know, what the asset is i mean if you that's a, that's the risk of any development right is that it, for the year two three years it takes you to develop whatever the thing is what does the market for that thing look like? And so I think that's something to consider. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, it's challenging and you are, you are much more dependent on the cycle and, and kind of where we're at in that. And so we've done a little bit in, in senior housing as well as medical, just because we feel like those are a little more protected from, uh, especially with the demographic of the aging uh, population and, and things like that, but you bring up a really um, good point. You bring up a really good point. Bronson is the the demand for those things that you're going after is still there, and it's still sure. strong. So again, you might have an asset class or something that you're considering developing. Maybe it's assisted living or or senior living or something like that, or, or medical. If there's a really strong demand for it, and the numbers make sense, and you have someone on your team with experience, go for it. Go for it. Like any development, whether you started three years ago or start today, reality, we don't know what's going to, what it's going to look like two or three years from now. Yeah. Yeah. hundred so. percent. That's it. Well, uh, Dallin, I really appreciate you, man. I appreciate your perspective. Um, you obviously have a lot of great experience. I remember uh, seeing you at the event. I really enjoyed your perspective on a lot of things and just your humble approach to stuff. And of course, you're a good looking bald head and your mustache. But um, I want to celebrate all those things for you, encourage people to reach out to you. If people do want to reach out and connect with you, what's the best way to be able to do that? Uh, honestly, they can go to our website. It's investwithrev.com. Rev is R-E-V, investwithrev.com. We have a ton of free resources and stuff on there. Um, we even have a checklist uh, of some of the top questions you should ask operators. So that's a free resource. You can go on there. You can find it. I know that's one of the things we talked about. It's a little over 60 points that we review before we partner with operators. And so those same questions and points that we go through, we offer it to anyone that wants it. So you can go to investwithrev.com and under the resources tab, you'll find it there. So that'll give you some general information. 
about just our our company. But if you want to connect personally, I'm I'm on LinkedIn. I'm making a a very intentional uh, decision to be more active on there and to connect with people. So would love to connect with you on there, and then uh, we can always connect, exchange personal information from there. Awesome. Awesome, Dallin. Well, great to connect with you. Appreciate you, man. And we'll look forward to being in touch. And I think I'm coming on your show here soon, which is The Millionaire Mind, right? That's what it's called, yeah. Millionaire yeah. Mind. Looking forward to being on there. And uh, thanks again for being here, brother. Appreciate you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Bronson. All right. I really enjoyed this interview. I enjoyed Dallin sharing about some of his injuries. Interesting. It was two injuries, one where he had hurt himself. I guess he's just, like you said, accident prone, but um, hurt his knee and then he was home and he didn't have any money in the bank. And that was very difficult. And then he had a issue where he had double, hit both elbows, like in casts or something, he couldn't move them. And he had six figures in the bank to be able to cover. It just gave him a whole different feeling of a whole different experience of going through that, of knowing that he was going to be okay. So these are the questions we really ask when it comes to fire yourself and in the mailbox money show is how do you uh, set yourself up so that you, uh, you know, you can work how you want to work and when you want to work and do it in the way that is going to make a difference in the world that you want to work in. So if you're in a job or you have a business and you're like, I don't know how to get out of this. If I stop working, if I stop, if I sell the business, I just don't have any cash. Well, that's what Mailbox Money is about. It's about developing the skills like a muscle that you can learn and grow to become a great investor that you can have a, a predictable return in different types of investments. And you have some diversity in case one deal doesn't go as well or one goes better. You have some diversity in that. But I found just in general, in my experience both as in the past, no longer, but as an investment advisor, advisor, um, I just found it very limiting to only be in Wall Street type of investments and not have availability to get into this. So I call it the gateway drug. You get started in multifamily or in other types of passive investing, and it opens up the world. It's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I haven't been doing this longer. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'd love to know your thoughts on it. Please feel free to reach out. If you haven't uh, joined our investment club, you can check that out at bronsonequity.com. We've got some things, a couple things right now. I'm just super super excited about. So check those out. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Mailbox Money Show. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.